The Story of Civilization, Volume 4, The Age of Faith, Part 3, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 9, Side 2. This dunce was one of the keenest minds in medieval history. Having studied mathematics and other sciences, and feeling the influence of Gross Test and Roger Bacon at Oxford, he formed a severe notion of what constituted proof, and applying that test to the philosophy of Thomas, he ended, almost in its honeymoon, the rash marriage of theology with philosophy. Despite his clear understanding of the inductive method, Duns argued, precisely contrary to Francis Bacon, that all inductive or a posteriori proof, from effect to cause, is uncertain, that the only real proof is deductive and a priori, to show that certain effects must follow from the essential nature of the cause. For example, to prove the existence of God, we must first study metaphysics, that is, study being as being, and by strict logic arrive at the essential qualities of the world. In the realm of essences, there must be one which is the source of all the rest, the primus. This first being is God. Duns agreed with Thomas that God is actus purus, but he interprets the phrase not as pure actuality, but as pure activity. God is primarily will rather than intellect. He is the cause of all causes and is eternal. But that is all that we can know of him by reason. That he is a God of mercy, that he is three in one, that he created the world in time, that he watches over all by providence. These and practically all the doctrines of the Christian faith are credibilia. They should be believed on the authority of the scriptures and the church, but they cannot be demonstrated by reason. Indeed, the moment we begin to reason about God, we run into baffling contradictions, the Kantian antimonies of pure reason. If God is omnipotent, he is the cause of all defects, including all evil, and secondary causes, including the human will, are illusory. In view of these ruinous conclusions, and because of the necessity of religious belief for our moral life, Kant's practical reason, it is wiser to abandon the Thomistic attempt to prove theology by philosophy and to accept the dogmas of the faith on the authority of the Bible and the Church. We cannot know God, but we can love Him, and that is better than knowing. In psychology, Duns is a realist after his own subtle fashion. Universals are objectively real, in the sense that those identical features which the mind abstracts from similar objects to form a general idea must be in the objects, else how could we perceive and abstract them? He agrees with Thomas that all natural knowledge is derived from sensation. For the rest, he differs from him all along the psychologic line. The principle of individuation is not matter but form, and form only in the strictest sense of thisness, hycetas, the peculiar qualities and distinguishing marks of the individual person or thing. The faculties of the soul are not distinct from one another, nor from the soul itself. The basic faculty of the soul is not understanding but will. It is the will that determines to what sensations or purposes the intellect is to attend. Only the will, voluntas, not the judgment, arbitrium, is free. Thomas's argument that our hunger for continuance and for perfect happiness proves the immortality of the soul proves too much, for it could be applied to any beast in the field. We cannot prove personal immortality, we must simply believe. As the Franciscans had claimed to see in Thomas the victory of Aristotle over the Gospels, so the Dominicans might have seen in Duns the triumph of Arabic over Christian philosophy. His metaphysic is Avicenna's, his cosmology is Ibn Gabiril's. But the tragic and basic fact in Scotus is his abandonment of the attempt to prove the basic Christian doctrines by reason. His followers carried the matter further and removed one after another of the articles of faith from the sphere of reason, and so multiplied his distinctions and subtleties that in England a dunsman came to mean a hair-splitting fool, a dull sophist, a dunce. Those who had learned to love philosophy refused to be subordinated to theologians who rejected philosophy. The two studies quarreled and parted, and the rejection of reason by faith issued in the rejection of faith by reason. So ended, for the age of faith, the brave adventure. Scholasticism was a Greek tragedy, whose nemesis lurked in its essence. The attempt to establish the faith by reason implicitly acknowledged the authority of reason. The admission by Duns Scotus and others that the faith could not be established by reason shattered scholasticism and so weakened the faith that in the 14th century revolt broke out all along the doctrinal and ecclesiastical line. 
Aristotle's philosophy was a Greek gift to Latin Christendom, a Trojan horse concealing a thousand hostile elements. These seeds of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment were not only the revenge of paganism over Christianity, they were also the unwitting revenge of Islam. Invaded in Palestine and driven from nearly all of Spain, the Moslems transmitted their science and philosophy to Western Europe, and it proved to be a disintegrating force. It was Avicenna and Averroes, as well as Aristotle, who infected Christianity with the germs of rationalism. But no perspective can dim the splendor of the scholastic enterprise. It was an undertaking as bold and rash as youth, and had youth's faults of overconfidence and love of argument. It was the voice of a new adolescent Europe that had rediscovered the exciting game of reason. Despite heresy-hunting councils and inquisitors, scholasticism enjoyed and displayed during the two centuries of its exaltation, a freedom of inquiry, thought, and teaching hardly surpassed in the universities of Europe today. With the help of the jurists of the 12th and 13th centuries, it sharpened the Western mind by forging the tools and terms of logic, and by such subtle reasoning as nothing in pagan philosophy could excel. Certainly this facility and argument ran to excess and generated the disputatious verbosity and scholastic hair-splitting against which not only Roger and Francis Bacon, but the Middle Ages themselves rebelled. Yet the good of the inheritance far outweighed the bad. Logic, ethics, and metaphysics, said Condorcet, owed to scholasticism a precision unknown to the ancients themselves. And it is to the schoolmen, said Sir William Hamilton, that the vulgar languages are indebted for what precision and analytical subtlety they possess. The peculiar quality of the French mind, its love of logic, its clarity, its finesse, was in large measure formed by the heyday of logic in the schools of medieval France. Scholasticism, which in the 17th century was to be an obstacle to the development of the European mind, was in the 12th and 13th centuries a revolutionary advance or restoration in human thought. Modern thought begins with the rationalism of Abelard, reaches its first peak in the clarity and enterprise of Thomas Aquinas, sustains a passing defeat in Duns Scotus, rises again with Occam, captures the papacy in Leo X, captures Christianity in Erasmus, laughs in Rabelais, smiles in Montaigne, runs riot in Voltaire, triumphs sardonically in Hume, and mourns its victory in Anatole France. It was the medieval dash into reason that founded that brilliant and reckless dynasty. Chapter 37 Christian Science, 1095-1300 to 1300. 1. The Magical Environment The Romans, at their imperial height, had valued applied science, but had almost forgotten the pure science of the Greeks. Already, in the natural history of the Elder Pliny, we find supposedly medieval superstitions on every other page. The indifference of the Romans cooperated with that of the Christians to almost dry up the stream of science long before the barbarian invasions littered the roots of cultural transmission with the debris of a ruined society. What remained of Greek science in Europe was buried in the libraries of Constantinople, and that remnant suffered in the sack of 1204. Greek science migrated through Syria into Islam in the ninth century and stirred Moslem thought to one of the most remarkable cultural awakenings in history— while Christian Europe struggled to lift itself out of barbarism and superstition. Science and philosophy in the medieval West had to grow up in such an atmosphere of myth, legend, miracle, omens, demons, prodigies, magic, astrology, divination, and sorcery, as comes only in ages of chaos and fear. All these had existed in the pagan world and exist today, but tempered by a civilized humor and enlightenment. They were strong in the Semitic world, and triumphed after Averroes and Maimonides. In Western Europe, from the 6th to the 11th century, they broke the dikes of culture and overwhelmed the medieval mind in an ocean of occultism and credulity. The greatest, most learned men shared in this credulity. Augustine thought that the pagan gods still existed as demons, and that fauns and satyrs were real. Abelard thought that demons can work magic through their intimate acquaintance with the secrets of nature. Alfonso the Wise accepted magic and sanctioned divination by the stars. How then should lesser men doubt? A multitude of mysterious and supernatural beings had descended into Christianity from pagan antiquity, and were still coming into it from Germany, Scandinavia, and Ireland, as trolls, elves, giants, fairies, goblins, gnomes, ogres, banshees, mysterious dragons, blood-sucking vampires— 
and new superstitions were always entering Europe from the east. Dead men walked the air as ghosts. Men who had sold themselves to the devil roamed woods and fields as werewolves. The souls of children dead before baptism haunted the marshes as will-o'-the-wisps. When St. Edmund Rich saw a flight of black crows, he recognized them at once as a flock of devils come to fetch the soul of a local usurer. When a demon is exorcised from a man, said many a medieval story, a big black fly, sometimes a dog, could be seen issuing from his mouth. The population of devils never declined. A hundred objects, herbs, stones, amulets, rings, gems, were worn for their magic power to ward off devils and bring good luck. The horseshoe was lucky because it had the shape of the crescent moon, which had once been a goddess. Sailors at the mercy of the elements and peasants, subject to all the whims of earth and sky, saw the supernatural at every turn and lived in a vital medium of superstitions. The attribution of magic powers to certain numbers came down from Pythagoras through the Christian fathers, Three, the number of the Trinity, was the holiest number and stood for the soul. Four represented the body. Seven, their sum, symbolized the complete man. Hence a predilection for seven, ages of man, planets, sacraments, cardinal virtues, deadly sins. A sneeze at the wrong time was a bad omen and had better be disarmed with a God bless you in any case. Filters could be used to create or destroy love. Conception could be avoided by spitting thrice into the mouth of a frog or holding a jasper pebble in the hand during coitus. The enlightened Agobard, Archbishop of Lyon in the ninth century, complained that things of such absurdity are believed by Christians as no one ever aforetime could induce the heathen to believe. The Church struggled against the paganism of superstition, condemned many beliefs and practices, and punished them with a gradation of penances. She denounced black magic, resort to demons to obtain power over events, but it flourished in a thousand secret places. Its practitioners circulated privately a Liber Perditionis, or Book of Damnation, giving the names, habitats, and special powers of the major demons. Nearly everybody believed in some magical means of turning the power of supernatural beings to a desired end. John of Salisbury tells of magic used by a deacon, a priest, and an archbishop. The simplest form was by incantation. A formula was recited, usually several times. By such formulas a miscarriage might be averted, a sickness healed, an enemy put out of the way. Probably the majority of Christians considered the sign of the cross, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ave Maria as magic incantations, and used holy water and the sacraments as magic rites, bringing miraculous effects. Belief in witchcraft was next to universal. The penitential book of the Bishop of Exeter condemned women who professed to be able to change men's minds by sorcery and enchantments, as from hate to love, or from love to hate, or to bewitch or steal men's goods, or who profess to ride on certain knights and on certain beasts with a host of demons in women's shape, and to be enrolled in the company of such. The witch's Sabbath that became notorious in the fourteenth century. A simple witchery consisted in making a wax model of an intended victim, piercing it with needles, and pronouncing formulas of cursing. A minister of Philip IV was accused of hiring a witch to do this to an image of the king. Some women were believed able to injure or kill by a look of their evil eye. Bertolt of Regensburg thought that more women than men would go to hell because so many women practiced witchcraft. Spells for getting a husband, spells for the marriage, spells before the child is born, spells before the christening. It is a marvel that men lose not their wits for the monstrous witchcrafts that women practice on them. Visigothic law accused witches of invoking demons, sacrificing to devils, causing storms, etc., and ordered that those convicted of such offenses should have their heads shaved and receive two hundred stripes. The laws of Canute in England recognized the possibility of slaying a person by magic means. The Church was at first lenient with these popular beliefs, looking upon them as pagan survivals that would die out. On the contrary, they grew and spread— and in 1298 the Inquisition began its campaign to suppress witchcraft by burning women at the stake. Many theologians sincerely believed that certain women were in league with demons, and that the faithful must be protected from their spells. Caesarius of Heisterbach assures us that in his time many men entered into pacts with devils, and it is alleged that such practitioners of black magic so disdained the church that they travestied her rites by worshipping Satan in a black mass. Thousands of sick or timid people believed themselves to be possessed by devils. The prayers, formulas, and ceremonies of exorcism used by the church 
may have been intended as psychological medicine to calm superstitious minds. Medieval medicine was in some measure a branch of theology and ritual. Augustine thought that the diseases of mankind were caused by demons, and Luther agreed with him. It seemed logical, therefore, to cure illness with prayer and epidemics by religious processions or building churches. So Santa Maria della Salute at Venice was raised to check a plague, and the prayers of saint Gerbold, Bishop of Bayeux, cured that city of an epidemic of dysentery. Good physicians welcomed the aid of religious faith in effecting cures. They recommended prayer and the wearing of amulets. As far back as Edward the Confessor, we find English rulers blessing rings for the cure of epilepsy. Kings, having been consecrated by religious touch, felt that they might cure by imposition of hands. Persons suffering from scrofula were supposed to be especially amenable to the royal touch, hence the name King's Evil for that ailment. St. Louis labored assiduously with such impositions, and Philip of Valois is said to have touched 1,500 persons at one sitting. There were magical means to knowledge as well as to health. Most of the old pagan methods for divining the future or seeing the absent flourished throughout the Middle Ages, despite repeated condemnation by the Church. Thomas a Becket, wishing to advise Henry II about a contemplated invasion of Brittany, consulted an Eruspex, who foretold the future by watching the flight of birds, and a chiromancer, who predicted by studying the lines of the hand. This art of palmistry claimed divine sanction from a verse in Exodus, chapter 13, verse 9, It shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand. Other prophets tried to foretell events by observing the movements of the winds, aromancy, or the waters, hydromancy, or the smoke rising from a fire, pyromancy. Some, imitating the Moslems, marked points at random lines upon the earth, or upon any writing material, connected the points with lines, and told fortunes from the geometrical figures so formed, geomancy. Some, it was alleged, learned the future from the evoked dead, necromancy. Albertus Grotus, at the request of Frederick Barbarossa, evoked, we are told, the spirit of the emperor's wife. Some consulted prophetic books, like those purporting to contain the predictions of the Sibyls, or Merlin, or Solomon. Some opened the Bible at random, Sortes Sanctorum, or the Aeneid, Sortes Virgilianae, and told the future from the first verse seen. The gravest medieval historians nearly always found, like Livy, that important events had been directly or symbolically foretold by portents, visions, prophecies, or dreams. There were heaps of books, for example one by Arnold of Villanova, offering the latest scientific interpretation of dreams, oniromancy not much sillier than those which famous scientists have written in the twentieth century. Nearly all these modes of divination or clairvoyance had been practiced in antiquity and are practiced today. But our time, despite some effort, has not yet equaled the age of faith, in Islam, Judaism, or Christendom, in belief that the future is decipherably written in the stars. If the climate of the earth and the growth of plants could be so clearly influenced by the heavenly bodies, why should not these affect may determine the growth, nature, illnesses, periods, fertility, epidemics, revolutions, and destinies of men or states. So nearly every medieval mind believed. A professional astrologer could be found in the household of almost every prince or king. Doctors bled their patients, as many farmers still plant their seeds, according to phases of the moon. Most universities gave courses in astrology, meaning by it the science of the stars. Astronomy was included in astrology and progressed largely through astrologic interest and aims. Sanguine students professed to have found predictable regularities in the effects of celestial bodies on the earth. Persons born under the ascendancy of Saturn would be cold, cheerless, Saturnine. Those born under Jupiter, temperate and jovial. Under Mars, ardent and martial. Under Venus, tender and fruitful. Under Mercury, inconstant, mercurial, under a high moon, melancholy almost to the point of lunacy. Genethleology predicted the entire life of the individual from the position of the constellations at his birth. To draw a proper horoscope, therefore, one had to observe the hour, take the precise moment of birth, the precise position of the stars. Astronomic tables were compiled chiefly to aid the drawing of such horoscopes. Certain names stand out in this period as pundits of the occult. Peter of Abano almost reduced philosophy to astrology, 
and Arnold de Villanova, a famous physician, had a predilection for magic. Cecco d'Ascoli, from 1257 to 1327, who taught astrology at the University of Bologna, boasted that he could read a man's thoughts or tell what he concealed in his hand by knowing the date of his birth. To illustrate his views, he cast the horoscope of Christ and showed how the constellations at the Nativity had made the crucifixion inevitable. He was condemned by the Inquisition in 1324, abjured, was spared on condition of silence, went to Florence, practiced astrology for numerous clients, and was burned at the stake for denying the freedom of the will in 1327. Many sincere students, Constantine the African, Gerbert, Albertus Magnus, Roger Bacon, Vincent de Beauvais, were accused of magic and of relations with devils because the people could not believe that their knowledge had been obtained by natural means. Michael Scott earned the suspicion by writing famous treatises on the occult. A Liber Introductorius on astrology, a Physiognomia on the correlation of qualities of character with peculiarities of body, and two texts of alchemy. Michael condemned magic, but enjoyed writing about it. He listed twenty-eight methods of divination, and seems to have believed in all of them. Unlike most of his contemporaries, he made careful observations and some experiments. On the other hand, he suggested that carrying a jasper or topaz would help a man to preserve continence. He was clever enough to keep on good terms with both Frederick II and the popes, but the inexorable Dante consigned him to hell. The Church and the Inquisition were part of the environment of European science in the 13th century. The universities, for the most part, operated under ecclesiastical authority and supervision. The Church, however, allowed considerable latitude of doctrine to professors, and in many cases encouraged scientific pursuits. William of Auvergne, Bishop of Paris, who died in 1249, promoted scientific investigation and ridiculed those who were ready to see the direct action of God in any unusual event. Bishop Grosteste of Lincoln was so advanced in the study of mathematics, optics, and experimental science that Roger Bacon ranked him with Aristotle. The Dominican and Franciscan orders made no known objection to the scientific studies of Albertus Magnus or Roger Bacon. St. Bernard and some other zealots discouraged the pursuit of science, but this view was not adopted by the Church. She found it hard to reconcile herself to the dissection of human cadavers, for it was among her basic doctrines that man was made in the image of God and that the body as well as the soul would rise from the grave. And this reluctance was fully shared by the Moslems and the Jews, and by the people at large. Guido of Vigevano, in 1345, spoke of dissection as forbidden by the Church, but we find no ecclesiastical prohibition before the bull De Sepulturis of Boniface the VIII in 1300. And this merely forbade the cutting up of corpses and the boiling away of their flesh, in order to send the sterilized bones of dead crusaders back to their relatives for burial at home. This may have been misinterpreted as forbidding post-mortem dissection, but we find the Italian surgeon Mondino boiling and dissecting corpses about 1320 without any known ecclesiastical protest. If achievements of medieval science in the West should seem meager in the following summary, let us remember that it grew in a hostile environment of superstition and magic, in an age that drew the best minds into law and theology, and at a time when nearly all men believed that the major problems of cosmic and human origin, nature, and destiny had been solved. Nevertheless, after 1150, as wealth and leisure grew, and translations began to pour in from Islam, the mind of Western Europe was aroused from its torpor, curiosity flared into eagerness, men began to discuss the brave old world of the unfettered Greeks, and within a century all Latin Europe was astir with science and philosophy. 2. The Mathematical Revolution The first great name in the science of this period is Leonardo Fibonacci of Pisa. Sumerian mathematics, born of forgotten parentage, had descended through Babylonia to Greece. Egyptian geometry, still visible in the pyramids, had passed, perhaps through Crete and Rhodes, to Ionia and Greece. Greek mathematics had gone to India in the wake of Alexander, and had played a part in the Hindu development that culminated in Brahmagupta, from 588 to 660. About 775, translations were made of Hindu mathematicians, and soon afterward of Greek mathematicians, into Arabic. About 830, the Hindu numerals entered Eastern Islam. 
About 1,000, Gerbert brought them to France. In the 11th and 12th centuries, Greek, Arabic, and Hebrew mathematics streamed into Western Europe through Spain and Sicily, and came with Italian merchants to Venice and Genoa, Amalfi and Pisa. Transmission is to civilization what reproduction is to life. Another line of transmission appeared in the 6th century B.C. in the form of the Chinese abacus, from the Greek abax, a board, an instrument for counting by transferring little bamboo rods from one group to another. Its descendant, the Suan Pan, is still used by the Chinese. In the 5th century B.C., says Herodotus, the Egyptians reckoned with pebbles, bringing the hand from right to left. The Greeks proceeded contrarywise. The Romans used several forms of the abacus. In one form, the counters slid in grooves. They were made of stone, metal, or colored glass, and were called calculi, little stones. Boethius, about 525, mentioned the abacus as enabling one to count by tens, but this invitation to a decimal system was ignored. The merchants of Italy used the abacus, but wrote the results in clumsy Roman numerals. Leonardo Fibonacci was born at Pisa in 1180. His father was manager of a Pisan trade agency in Algeria. Leonardo in adolescence joined him there and was taught by a Muslim master. He traveled in Egypt, Syria, Greece, and Sicily, studied the methods of the merchants, and learned to reckon, he tells us, by a marvelous method through the nine figures of the Indians. Here, at the outset of their European career, the new numerals were properly called Hindu, and what is now a bore and chore of our childhood was then a wonder and delight. Perhaps Leonardo learned Greek as well as Arabic. In any case, we find him well acquainted with the mathematics of Archimedes, Euclid, Hero, and Diophantus. In 1202 he published his Liber Abaci. It was the first thorough European exposition of the Hindu numerals, the zero, and the decimal system by a Christian author, and it marked the rebirth of mathematics in Latin Christendom. The same work introduced Arabic algebra to Western Europe and made a minor revolution in that science by occasionally using letters instead of numbers to generalize and abbreviate equations. In his Practica Geometriae of 1220, Leonardo, for the first time in Christendom, so far as we know, applied algebra to the treatment of geometrical theorems. In two smaller works of the year 1225, he made original contributions to the solution of equations of the first and second degree. In that year, Frederick II presided at Pisa over a mathematical tournament in which different problems were set by John of Palermo and solved by Fibonacci. Despite his epic-making work, the new method of calculation was long resisted by the merchants of Europe. Many of them preferred to finger the abacus and write the results with Roman numerals. As late as 1299, the abbasists of Florence had a law passed against the use of the new-fangled figures. Only a few mathematicians realized that the new symbols, the zero and the decimal alignment of units, tens, hundreds, opened the way to such developments of mathematics as were almost impossible with the old letter numerals of Greeks, Romans, and Jews. Not till the 16th century did the Hindu numerals finally replace the Roman. In England and America, the duodecimal system of reckoning survives in many fields. Ten has not finally won its thousand-year-long war against twelve. Mathematics in the Middle Ages had three purposes, the service of mechanics, the keeping of business accounts, and the charting of the skies. Mathematics, physics, and astronomy were closely allied, and those who wrote on one of them usually contributed to the others as well. So John of Holywood, in Yorkshire, known to the Latin world as Ioannis de Sacrobosco, studied at Oxford, taught at Paris, wrote a Tractatus de Sphera, treatise on the earthly sphere, and an exposition of the new mathematics, Algorismus Vulgaris, Mathematics for the Millions, circa 1230. Algorismus, a corruption of the name al Quarizmi was the Latin term for an arithmetical system using the Hindu numerals. John credited the Arabs with the invention of this system and was partly responsible for the misnomer Arabic numerals. Robert of Chester, about 1149, in adapting the astronomical tables of Al-Batani and Al-Zarqali, brought Arabic trigonometry to England and introduced the word sinus, for bay or sign, into the new science. Interest in astronomy was maintained by the needs of navigation and the passion for astrology. 
the immense authority of the oft translated Almagest, petrified the astronomy of Christian Europe into the Ptolemaic theory of eccentrics and epicycles, with the earth at the hub of the world. Alert minds like Albertus Magnus, Thomas Aquinas, and Roger Bacon felt the force of the criticisms that the Moorish astronomer Albertrugi had aimed at this system in the twelfth century, but no satisfactory alternative to Ptolemy's celestial mechanics was found before Copernicus. Christian astronomers in the thirteenth century pictured the planets as revolving about the earth. The fixed stars, snared in a crystal firmament and steered by divine intelligences, revolved as a regimented host around the earth, and the center and summit of the universe was that same man whom the theologians described as a miserable worm, tainted with sin and mostly doomed to hell. The suggestion offered by Heraclides Ponticus, four centuries before Christ, that the apparent daily motion of the heavens was due to the axial rotation of the earth, was discussed by Semitic astronomers in the thirteenth century, but was quite forgotten in Christendom. Another notion of Heraclides, that Mercury and Venus revolved about the sun, had been handed down by Macrobius and Martianus Capella. John Scotus Origina had seized upon it in the eighth century, and had extended it to Mars and Jupiter. The heliocentric system was on the verge of victory, but these brilliant hypotheses were among the casualties of the Dark Ages, and the earth held the center of the stage till 1521. All astronomers, however, agreed that the earth is a sphere. The astronomical instruments and tables of the West were imported from Islam, or were modeled on Islamic originals. In 1091, Valker of Lorraine, later prior of Malvern Abbey, observed lunar eclipses in Italy with an astrolabe. This is the earliest known case of observational astronomy in the Christian West. But even two centuries later, circa 1296, William of St. Cloud had to remind astronomers, by precept and example, that the science grew best on observation rather than on reading or philosophy. The best contribution to Christian astronomy in this period was the Alphonsine Tables of Celestial Movements, prepared for Alfonso the Wise by two Spanish Jews. The accumulation of astronomic data revealed the imperfections of the calendar established by Julius Caesar in 46 B.C. from the work of Sisygenes, which made the year too long by 11 minutes and 14 seconds. And the increasing intercourse of astronomers, merchants, and historians across frontiers exposed the inconvenience of conflicting calendars. Al-Biruni had made a useful study of the rival systems of dividing time and dating events, circa 1,000. Aaron ben Meshulam and Abraham Barhia furthered the study in 1106 and 1122, and Robert Grosstest and Roger Bacon followed with constructive proposals in the 13th century. The Computus, circa 1232 of Grosstest, a set of tables for calculating astronomic events and movable dates, for example Easter, was the first step toward the Gregorian calendar of 1582 that guides and confuses us today. 3. The Earth and Its Life The least progressive medieval science was geology. The earth was the chosen home of Christ, and the shell of hell, and weather was the whim of God. Moslem, Jew, and Christian alike covered mineralogy with superstition and composed lapidaries on the magical powers of stones. Marbid, Bishop of Rennes, who lived from 1035 to 1123, wrote in Latin verse a popular Liber Lapidum, describing the occult qualities of sixty precious stones. A sapphire held in the hand during prayer, said this erudite bishop, would secure a more favorable answer from God. An opal folded in a bay leaf rendered its holder invisible. An amethyst made him immune to intoxication. A diamond made him invincible. The same eager curiosity that spawned superstitions upon the minerals of the earth sent medieval man wandering over Europe and the East, and slowly enriched geography. Geraldus Cambrensis, Gerald of Wales, 1147-1223, roamed over many lands and topics, mastered many tongues but not his own, accompanied Prince John to Ireland, lived there two years, toured Wales to preach the Third Crusade, and wrote four vivacious books on the two countries. He weighed down his pages with bias and miracles, but lightened them with vivid accounts of persons and places, and lively gossip of the trivial things that make the color of a character or an age. 
He was sure that his works would immortalize him, but he underestimated the forgetfulness of time. He was one of thousands who in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries made a pilgrimage to the east. Maps and routes were drawn to guide them, and geography benefited. In 1107 to 1111, Sigurd Jorsalafarer, king of Norway, sailed as a crusader with sixty ships via England, Spain, and Sicily to Palestine. After fighting Moslems at every opportunity, he led his lessened band to Constantinople, and thence overland through the Balkans, Germany, and Denmark to Norway. The story of this adventurous journey forms one of the great Scandinavian sagas. In 1270, Lanzarote Malocello rediscovered the Canary Islands, which had been known to antiquity. About 1290, Ugolino and Vadino Vivaldo, according to an unverified tradition, set out from Genoa in two galleys to sail around Africa to India. All hands, it appears, were lost. A famous hoax took the form of a letter from a mythical Prester John, circa 1150, who told of his dominions in Central Asia and gave a fantastic geography of the Orient. Despite the Crusades, few Christians believed in the Antipodes. St. Augustine considered it incredible that a people inhabits the Antipodes, where the sun rises when it sets with us, and where men walk with their feet toward ours. An Irish monk, St. Fergal, had suggested about 748 the possibility of another world and other men under the earth. Albertus Magnus and Roger Bacon accepted the idea, but it remained the daring concept of a few until Magellan circumnavigated the globe. The chief contributions to European knowledge of the Far East were made by two Franciscan monks. In April 1245, Giovanni de Piano Carpini, sixty-five and fat, was sent by Innocent IV to the Mongol court at Karakorum. Giovanni and his companion suffered in the enterprise every hardship this side of death. They traveled for fifteen months changing horses four times a day. Pledged by the Franciscan rule to eat no meat, they almost starved among nomads who had hardly any other food to give them. Giovanni's mission failed, but after his return to Europe he compiled an account of his journey which is a classic in the literature of geography. Clear, impersonal, matter-of-fact, without a word of self or complaint. In 1253, Louis IX sent William of Rubruki, Wilhelm van Ruysbroek, to the great Khan to renew the Pope's suggestion of an alliance. William brought back a stern invitation to submit France to the Mongol power, and all that came of the expedition was William's excellent account of Mongol manners and history. Here, for the first time, European geography learned the sources of the Don and the Volga, the position of Lake Balkash, the cult of the Dalai Lama, the settlements of Nestorian Christians in China, and the distinction of Mongols from Tatars. The most famous and successful of medieval European travelers in the Far East were the Polo family of Venetian merchants. Andrea Polo had three sons, Marco the Elder, Niccolo, and Maffeo, all engaged in Byzantine trade and living in Constantinople. About 1260, Niccolo and Maffeo moved to Bokhara, where they remained three years. Thence they traveled in the train of a Tatar embassy to the court of Kublai Khan at Shangtu. Kublai sent them back as emissaries to Pope Clement IV. They took three years to reach Venice, and by that time Clement was dead. In 1271 they started back to China, and Niccolo took with him his boy Marco the Younger, then seventeen. For three and a half years they traveled across Asia via Balkh, the Pamir Plateau, Kashgar, Khotan, Lopnor, the Gobi Desert, and Tangut. When they reached Shangtu, Marco was almost twenty-one. Kublai took a fancy to him, gave him important posts and missions, and kept the three poli in China for seventeen years. Then they sailed back through three years via Java, Sumatra, Singapore, Ceylon, and the Persian Gulf, overland to Trebizond, and by boat to Constantinople and Venice, where, as all the world knows, no one would believe the tales Marco Millions told of the gorgeous East. Fighting for Venice in 1298, Marco was captured and was kept for a year in a Genoese jail. There he dictated his narrative to a fellow prisoner. Nearly every element in the once incredible story has been verified by later exploration. Marco gave the first description of a trip across all Asia, the first European glimpse of Japan, the first good account of Pekin, Java, Sumatra, 
Siam, Burma, Ceylon, the Zanzibar coast, Madagascar, and Abyssinia. The book was a revelation of the East to the West. It helped to open new routes to commerce, ideas, and arts, and shared in molding the geography that inspired Columbus to sail westward to the East. As the orbit of commerce and travel widened, the science of cartography crept laboriously back toward the level it had reached in Augustus's days. Navigators prepared portolani, guides to the ports of trade, with maps, charts, itineraries, and descriptions of the various harbors. In the hands of the Pisans and Genoese, these portolani reached a high degree of accuracy. The mappai mundi, drawn by the monks of this period, are by comparison schematic and incomprehensible. Stimulated by the zoological treatises of Aristotle and the botanical classic of Theophrastus, the awakening mind of the West struggled to graduate from legend and Pliny to a science of animals and plants. Nearly everyone believed that minute organisms, including worms and flies, were spontaneously generated from dust, slime, and putrefaction. Bestiaries had almost replaced zoology. Since monks did almost all the writing, the animal world was considered largely in theological terms as a storehouse of edifying symbolism and additional creatures were invented in playful fancy or pious need. Said Bishop Honorius of Autun in the twelfth century, The unicorn is a very fierce beast with only one horn. To capture it, a virgin maid is placed in the field. The unicorn approaches her, and resting in her lap is so taken. By the beast Christ is figured, by the horn his insuperable strength. Resting in the womb of a virgin, he was taken by the hunters, that is, Christ was found in the form of a man by those who loved him. The most scientific work of medieval biology was Frederick II's De Arte Venandi Cum Avibus, a 589-page treatise on the art of hunting with birds. It was based partly on Greek and Moslem manuscripts, but largely on direct observation and experiment. Frederick himself was an expert falconer. His description of bird anatomy contains a great number of original contributions. His analysis of the flight and migration of birds, his experiments on the artificial incubation of eggs, and the operations of vultures show a scientific spirit unique in his age. Frederick illustrated his text with hundreds of drawings of birds, perhaps from his own hand, drawings true to life down to the tiniest details. The menagerie that he collected was not, as most contemporaries thought, a whim of bizarre display, but a laboratory for the direct study of animal behavior. This Alexander was his own Aristotle. 4. Matter and Energy Physics and chemistry did better than geology and biology. Their laws and marvels have always harmonized better than a nature read in tooth and claw with a theistic view of the world. Their vitality is suggested near the outset of this period by the efforts of Oliver of Malmesbury to make an airplane. In 1065 his contraption was ready. He soared in it from a high place and was killed. The science of mechanics produced in the 13th century a remarkable figure, a Dominican monk who anticipated several basic conceptions of Isaac Newton. This book is continued on Cassette 10, Side 1.